keep on going, keep on working. And he works and he works for the Lord. And uh, amen. I, I, I think that's a great thing. And God's blessings have certainly been upon him in that regard. So I uh, believe at this time we'll go ahead and have him to come on up and just share with us this morning uh, what he has. So let's, let's give them a good welcome this morning. blessing it is to me to be here. God's work is important. Is important. It's the most important. You know, if a young person or an older person or any person has not accepted Christ as their Savior, they don't have much to look forward to, do they? It's a rough life ahead, a long life ahead. They don't have nothing to look forward to, but that personal relationship with the Lord is the most important decision they'll ever make. That they'll ever make. And, and you know, as we as Gideons, you know what our goal is? You ever heard of a goal? You know what a goal is? Do you set goals? The goal you might have right now, you'd be glad when that snow is all gone. <laughs> but you know, a goal is reach more. More, more, and more. Amen. And before I go any much farther, I'm going to let him show us a movie. It is, I just have to say, this is such a blessing for me because I absolutely adore and love the Gideon ministry and I'm so thankful for your faithfulness. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sarah McCulloch. I'm a pastor's wife from the LA area and I've been married for 10 years and um, I've known the Lord now for 12. And um, my maiden name is Sara Musa Abishafia. I grew up in a Muslim home. And my, um, I'm the eldest of seven children. And my father is from Libya, which if you know anything about that country, it's in the 1040 window. They claim 97% Muslim and 3% other, which they would claim as foreigners. They're very proud of being a Muslim nation. My mother is a convert from Christianity to Islam. She grew up in a pretty nominal Christian home. They went to church, but her, um, I believe, of course, that she did not know Jesus, but um, she said that Christians lived like hell Monday through Saturday and went to church and asked for forgiveness on Sunday, and she couldn't believe in a God like that. So I grew up in that framework, believing that um, grace was just an excuse for sin. And so I, I have lived in the United States most of my life. I only lived overseas for a couple of years, which is why I have no accents. But I did grow up in a very conservative Muslim home. And most of my family um, overseas have never heard the gospel, which is such a hard thing, I think, sometimes um, for believers here to understand. Uh, maybe not the Gideon ministry, but I think, you know, oftentimes we struggle with that idea because we have churches on every corner and we have Bibles in almost every home. But my family has never heard the gospel there. But growing up, I fellowshiped amongst our Libyan community. And um, I grew up with a great fear of God. I knew that Allah was all-knowing. I knew that he was powerful. I knew that he had wrath. But I didn't know the, how, the love of God. I didn't know that he was personal. And I didn't know about his mercy. And so we lived and practiced the five pillars of Islam. I wore a scarf since I was in second grade as a young girl. And um, we prayed five times a day. I remember waking up early in the morning with my dad and doing um, our prayers each day. And um, it was very important to me to be honorable in my family, considering that I was the eldest and the eldest daughter. So it was very important for me. And so I worked very hard at doing that, whether that be dress or conduct or religious duty. Um, I worked very hard to do that. But I will say that my relationship with God was very distant. 
and pretty insatiable. Because if you know anything about Islam, it's performance-based, it's work-based, good deeds versus bad deeds. And I knew in my heart, even before I knew Jesus, that I was a sinner, that the things in my heart, the thoughts that I thought, the, the, the feelings that I felt, um, left me inadequate to live this life perfectly. And so by the time I got to my junior year in high school, I started asking big questions, which I think most young people do at some point. And I started asking things like, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What has God created me for? Is my life purely about obedience or is there joy in my relationship with God? Why am I here? What have you created me for? And so I began to pray and ask God for those answers, and of course I hear, heard nothing. And then I began to go to our mosque and ask some of the women, um, the older women, uh, and, and even you know some of my dad, my dad and my dad's friends. My father was a sheikh in the in the masjid, and so anyways, I would ask, and um, I was surprised. I was presented with all of these criticisms and some very harsh words because I was questioning tradition. I was, I was questioning religious law. And so I grew pretty um, just hopeless, and I started began to struggle with this idea of my faith. And so I love Romans 3.20 because I knew this before I was ever a believer, but it says, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. It did its work. The law did its work. I knew I was a sinner. I just didn't know the solution. So I began to feel shame, and then I realized, I look around, and I see all these men and women in our masjid, and they were, you know, doing all of these things perfectly. And I kept thinking, how come I cannot do this? Why am I failing? And so I began to just spin this shame cycle, and began to just feel very embarrassed and very inadequate. And so, of course, as a young person, I started to look around. I looked outside of the mosque, I started looking to the world, and I saw all these people happy, laughing, joyful, going out, doing things, and I thought, maybe they have the answer. So I started to go down a road of rebellion, and I, and I joined them in the world, thinking that, that I might find happiness there, I might find some answers. Well, my rebellion started out as a taste of freedom, and it quickly enslaved me. The scriptures say, you know, there's a way that seems right to a man, and in the end it leads to death, and that was me. And I became a very uh, big disappointment for my father. It was a big shameful thing in the mosque. It was embarrassing. And I ended up going fully into this a life of rebellion. By the time I was 18 years old, I moved out of my home. I severed most of the contact with my family and um, just did whatever I thought would possibly please me. And I'll tell you this, I never found joy in the world. In fact, I was miserable. It caused so much destruction in my life and it severed my, my relationship with my family. I was hurting and I could find no answers. So, you know, being a disgrace, I was the eldest of seven kids, and I was their daughter, their eldest daughter, who had had marriage proposals before I even exited high school. That was such an honorable thing for my dad, and suddenly now I was here in this place of just total destruction. So, you know, religion didn't satisfy me, the world totally disappointed me, and here I was going, I have no answers. So I cried out to God one night, and I just said, God, if you are real, if you want me, you come find me, because I don't know what to do. I ended up calling my family, and I apologized to them. I asked them, you know, if they would forgive me, and if I could come home, and they let me come home. And I began to venture back into my roots of Islam, went back to the mosque, started uh, doing my, you know, daily prayers, and all of those things. I was trying to earn that honor back. And I started back at a junior college in Torrance, California, and um, there, uh, towards the end of the year in 2001, there was a group of Gideons standing in the quad, and they were handing out Bibles. And normally I would never take one, because even though I wasn't a Christian, I respected their book enough not to just take it and, like, discard it. But to that day, I just happened to be running late for class, and so I didn't have time to explain. So I said, thank you 
very much and I put it in the pocket of my backpack and I ran off to class. Well, I didn't think about that Bible for months. Until in January 2002, a Christian young man, he played baseball at El Camino College, his name was Chris McCulloch, began to talk to me about this guy, Jesus. And so I was really interested in how much he loved the Lord because it was very sincere. It wasn't um, compelled by fear or compelled by guilt or it wasn't this works-based thing. It was just this genuine, overflowing joy and love for his Savior. And I thought, that is really interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious about this guy. And so um, he asked me to dinner one night and he spent two hours sharing with me about Jesus. And I thought, wow, this guy really loves God. This guy, what is so different about him? And I always thought, well, that's great for you, but I never thought of that for myself. Well, as our friendship grew, he, we were talking one night, and he said, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And I was completely offended. How could he tell me that 21 years of my life had been a lie? How could he tell me that my family, not knowing Jesus, would not end up in eternity in heaven with God? Even because they were doing so many wonderful things, living this righteous life, doing all this stuff. How could you say that? That 21 years of my life and that my family that has never heard the gospel would not be with their Savior in heaven. How can you say that? And so I remembered that I had a Gideon New Testament. This is actually the very one. It's kind of tattered, but this is it. And um, I began to read it to refute what he had just told me. And so I started Matthew 1. By the time I got to Matthew 13, the Lord had spoken to me. And I cannot tell you, this was the first time that God had ever spoken to my heart in all this time, in all those years. And the, the portion of scripture that I had been reading was the parable of the sower and the seed. And at the end of that, it says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And God said, listen. I am speaking to your hearts. And he reminded me of that moment when I had said, God, if you want me, come find me. And I began to listen for the first time in my life. I didn't give my life to the Lord that, that day, but I did call a friend. She had given her life to the Lord in high school, and um, she, her life had done a complete 180. And so I asked her, I said, hey, how, what, had, what happened in your life? And she um, explained some of her testimonies to me, and, I, and she asked, can I call you tomorrow? I said, of course. So she called me the next day and asked me, where are you? And I said, I'm at home. She said, can you come to the airport and get me? My friend lived in Alabama. She got on a plane, flew to California to come share the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. So she took me to coffee. We spent five hours talking. She answered all my questions, took me through the Romans Road. I still didn't give my life to the Lord at that point, but we went to go and visit this young man who had started this entire conversation because I felt, you know, she probably should meet this guy that started this whole problem. So we went and we're sitting on a dark street corner in front of his apartment and I just broke down in tears and felt the Holy Spirit just say, respond. And I responded there on March 5th of 2002 with my Gideon Bible in my car, asking Jesus into my life. And I stood humble because for the first time in my life, I was free. I don't know if you ever felt that, but it was just a freedom. No more weights and balances, no more works, just the love and mercy of a loving God who was personal to me, personal. And so, after that, I would tell my parents that I accepted Christ, I'd get kicked out of my house. I'd lost my relationship with them for several years. I ended up moving to Texas, where the Lord just planted me in a great community of believers. And when I didn't have a family, he provided one. So Chris and I began to date and eventually got married in 2004. And we've been involved in ministry ever since. And if you had told me then that I'd be a pastor's wife today, I would have laughed at you. But today I stand blessed to get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's been an amazing adventure. And today my family has all heard the gospel. One of my brothers has responded. 
And so we thank the Lord for that. So I just want to leave you with this. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it continues to pierce hearts. And so the theme of your um, convention, be strong and very courageous, I love it. Be strong and very courageous to hand that Word of God out, because it is life to its hearers. And so I just want to leave you with this scripture. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of the gospel. I am eternally grateful to the Gideon ministry. Because without a faithful Gideon handing me that scripture, I may not have responded to Christ. And I thank you so much for the gift of that scripture and the gift and the life that it has provided me. So God bless you and your ministry. May the Lord continue to just pour out his grace as you serve him. Thank you. If you haven't heard me say it, that's the reason we hand out Bibles. Give them out one by one to each person that we can. We go to Walmart, we find an aisle that we haven't given a Bible to if we can. And we go down the aisle, and that lady said, well, You give me one a long month ago, you give me one. <laughs> but anyway, you know. In Isaiah 55 11, it tells us that His word will not return void, it will accomplish that which He desires. It will reach people, men, women, boys, and girls for Christ. And that's what we're after. You know, many years ago, in the early 1900s, by 1908, they, the three guys that had started getting ministry, William Knight, John Nicholson, Samuel Hill, those three guys met and started the Gideons. They met and they met and they figured out a name to call the Gideon organization and that's where it started and by 1908 they had come up with this name and anyway they decided they would put Bibles in motels and, and most of us know that that's where the Bibles first started that is in motel rooms for traveling men and women would travel by train and in 1908 I don't think there was many cell phones. Communication and air conditioned cars and things like that weren't real everywhere. <laughs> but anyway, you know, as as they started out with those 25 Bibles they decided to get, they put them in a motel room in Superior, Montana. And they we still are putting them in that motel. And I might tell you this. The Rowing River Resort at top of Rowing River Hill, as you come out of the park and top of the hill there, has changed owners. And the owner calls, called us the other day, wanted new Bibles for the motel. You know what we did? We took them down there. Amen. Keith Daniels took them down there just last weekend. And the new hospital in Monad, we're going to get them in there too. We wish we could have known just before they opened, we could have got in there with this COVID going on, you know, the cleaning everything. And we were going to have to put the Bibles in a plastic bag to put them in there. What the heck? What's wrong with that? <laughs> but you know, we're going to put them in that new motel or the new hospital in Monet too. And that's our goal is to do that more of it. <coughs> and you know, the, there's a motel out at East or going out of Cassville on 37. They called us last year, I think, or year before, and they needed some more Bibles up there, so we took Bibles up there. And we put them out there. And I know you don't see them, and you don't see us doing that. But if you go somewhere and you stay in a motel, check and see in there if it is one in there. If there's not, tell them at the desk. We said, Hey, where's my Gideon Bible? You no know, people throw up hissy fit if there's one in there we can throw a hissy fit if there's not one in there <laughs> but you know I'd like to tell you about a testimony of a family that moved, moved next door to a family no matter where but the, the family moved next door to this thing they lived there quite a while and the family that just moved in had more furniture than they needed they had uh, they didn't have room for all the furniture I couldn't, I couldn't have told them they could brought them to my house and we got storage space, we rented them. But anyway, this couple
couple come over and they earned, uh, asked them if they needed some more furniture. They had more than they needed. And the furniture that they gave them was a nightstand. And it went into the older son's bedroom. And of course, after it got in there, the son went to looking through it to see, you know, what was in there. And there was a Gideon Bible in the top drawer of that dresser, that little nightstand. You know, and it, was that an accident? <laughs> I don't think so. Just like those three guys, man, it was no accident. But you know, with that Bible was in that little drawer of that little nightstand. And the boy went to read it and, his, and he said something to his dad. He said, Dad, he said, there's a little, there's a little church down the street down here. Could we go down there? And he said, son, you're just burning your wheels. It's worthless. It's just, it's nothing. Forget it. Don't even think about it. And he kept reading that little Bible. And, and he decided, well, he wasn't going to do what Dad said. Dad told him not to go down there, but he slipped off and went down there. And went to go to church down there in a few weeks. And his, and his younger brother said, he said, I know she's been leaving. Have you been going down the street there, going to church? He said, yeah, I've been, I've been going there. You want to go with me? So they both went down there. I don't know how they hid, but they, they got out of the house anyway and went down the street to the church and got to visiting down there and get reading in God's Word. If we're, we're not return void. Isaiah 55 11. Hebrews 4 12. It's sharp and powerful. Mm -hmm. It will reach and penetrate. Amen. You know, and, and it tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And we all need that personal experience. But anyway, those two boys got to going down there, and, and Dad said, Dad could tell a difference in the boys. Their attitude had kind of changed. Or, I don't know. He said, uh, He said, You boys. Been going off down there to church like I told you not to? Yeah, Dad, we did. We got to go on down there. You know what's, what? Mom and I was going to go down there with you. <laughs> Mom and I was going to go with you just because of that little Bible on that nightstand. Isn't that something how that one little Bible reaches? Yeah. And that's our goal is to do more. And you know, as it started out that 25 Bibles years ago in Superior, Montana, just this. A year ago in January, before all this COVID thing, there's a bunch of Gideons, 12, oh my gosh, 12 Gideons went to, to the Philippines in the big city of Manila. And they took Bibles out there. And they spent two weeks out there, two weeks in Manila. And they went to schools, hospitals, every place, motels, every place they could put Bibles. You know what they done? They just give out 465,000 Bibles while they were there in the two weeks. And people accepted the Lord as their Savior. They would get a group of uh, kids and they preach. How many times does a preacher get in our schools up here to preach in a classroom? You know, it don't happen. Kansas City, St. Louis. We don't do that. In our area right here, in Cassville and Berry County, we get into some of the schools. We didn't this past year because of the COVID thing. But we go to Warsburg, we put our Bibles out on a table, and the kids come by. We give them to the fifth graders, is what we try to do. But when they go to other countries, like those other countries, they give them out to all the kids. You know, no age group, I don't think. I don't know just what age group they start, but they go growing up through the high school. And you know, as, as back Lloyd services, we get to do that. I called Mr. Asbel at Cassville. I said, is there a chance that we can take, give Bibles at it to back Lloyd services? And he said, I'll call you back a little bit. He called a ministerial alliance in Cassville. He called me back. He said, bring them on. Bring them on. You know, it's just like saying, seek them to a dog. <laughs> But we took them up there. And we give them out there. And you know, I hope it gets back to where we can do that. Man. I went to the Wheaton schools. And the principal took me back to the fifth grade classroom. To them. She said, Daddy, you want to say anything to them kids before you give them out? And I said, I sure do. And I talked a little bit. And we give each one of those little kids a Bible in fifth grade in two rooms. That don't happen every time. But I thank the Lord. We keep praying that we can do that. And you pray for us. That we can keep getting in those schools. 
and giving God's word out. And we want to do that everywhere. And I, I know of uh, the past year, our goal, of course, we didn't get, reach a goal. We didn't go over the goal the year before of Bibles given out in the United States. But in the world, world scripture placements is 2 billion 407 million 644 thousand Bibles. That's a little different than 25 starting out. You know, and as we go to Branson, we meet in Branson in September. We didn't just pass September because of the virus thing. We didn't meet because of the, the group of us. With six states, we get together and go down there to Branson. We meet and have uh, fellowship on Saturday. We do just, just exactly like this on Sunday. We went to clear to Bradyville, Dave and I, and we drove different places to give the church presentations. But you know, as we've done that, on Monday we meet at the Toy Museum, and we got Bibles there, and we take Bibles and go check every motel in Branson. There's a whole group of us meet there, and we take three of us, three of them went in my car, we take cases of Bibles, and we go to the motels and hotels and different places down there. As we did that, one week, one time, I went right down 76 Country Boulevard, and I thought, well, I don't, it's going to be, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> this is just what I want to do. Went down and we went to a motel, and I was surprised how many, they were even closed. You know, probably for sale or something, but anyway, and I've gone to some, and it was a young people, I thought, huh. These young people must have had some money from somewhere because they own that motel. And we asked them about putting Bibles in their motel rooms. She said, we want a Bible in every one of them. And another motel we went to down on the, clear down to Lake Tanycoma below the dam. Guy down there told us, he said, you don't have to worry about them Bibles down here. He said, I put leather bound Bibles in my rooms. I'll take care of that myself. You don't have to worry about us down here. But we do that. We check those places. We went to Big Cedar Lodge. Bass Pro place, and a lot of that you can't, we can't get in because they're occupied, the rooms you can't get in, so in that case, we don't give them out one by one. But the housekeeping takes that Bibles, and all the cases we leave and puts them in the rooms. And they're doing that. They've took some Bibles out, we try to replace those Bibles every six years, and we don't throw that Bible away. We take that Bible, and the Kimberly City Campus found out they have contacted the Fulton Federal Prison at Fulton, Missouri. They said, bring all them Bibles you can bring us. We'll take every one of them. We've got to take a hard cover off like the motel Bibles. Five dollars a motel Bible. They take the hard cover off. They put a soft cover on and take them up to Fulton. They took them up there by carloads. But they're going to get a bunch together. You know, three or four thousand. I don't know. We, we'll never know how many people in those places are saved in those federal prisons. You know, they made a mistake. Did you ever make a mistake? Dad whipped me sometime, told me you shouldn't have done that or something like that. Always got along better with Dad, but did what he said. <laughs> but you know, those testimonies are unreal. And there's a, in the, how many thousands of Bibles, of course, our goal is to do more. We're in a hundred or in 200 countries, uh, have 108 different languages, and we try to hand out Bibles. The, and the life book is another way that you can, the kids, the church, just like the church here, you can order life books. We give Dave some information there. And the kids can take those life books to school and give them out. But they won't let us give the Bible out, but that's a little bit different. Look, but the kids can give kids a book or a Bible even for that reason but well that's another way in which the Gideons are reaching people because <clears throat> the Gideons have nothing to do with the life book that's another deal but it is a way of getting God's word into kids hands and that's our goal is to do more of that and, and reach more people but you know as we do that you pray for us and we pray that and we meet every Saturday morning. We just met yesterday morning at the 
we were meeting in the hospital, but they won't let us in there now because of the virus thing, you know, the COVID. So we're meeting in the Victory Baptist Church. They, they let us meet in there. We meet in the basement every Saturday morning. We pray for you churches. We pray for pastors. And we try to send a card to a different pastor every week. We sign those cards. We mail them out. Different pastor over the county. But as we do that, we want the goal of Gideon's to do more. You know what I'd like to tell you about? Debbie was a waitress in a restaurant. And as Debbie came out to wait on a fella, Gideon, he got talking to her and offered her a Bible and got to go on over and show her in the front of the book where the, there's, if you have a problem in your life, it's got a place in there. You can find a reference to that, what page it is and so on, what scripture to look up. And it's got a GPS in the back. The GPS in the back of those books, and that's God's plan of salvation. You know, as he witnessed to Debbie, Debbie accepted the Lord as her Savior. <laughs> and of course, Debbie was not allowed to just keep sitting there. He, she finally had to go back to work and minister together. She hugged him up and thanked him. He gave her that little New Testament he shared with her. And Debbie goes back, back into the kitchen where she's a waitress. And he said it wasn't a half a shake till another lady come out. She come out and she got down on her knees in front of the table he was in. He said, do you have another one of them Bibles? Debbie was telling me about that Bible back here. She said, I think I need one of them too. But Debbie was already a missionary telling others <laughs> about Jesus. Isn't that what we're supposed to do as a Christian? To advertise Jesus, tell everyone we see. Don't be ashamed to tell the good news. Because it might not be long till the Lord comes back. That's right. No. It is very close. It is very close. And we thank you. And another ministry we have is the card program. And you have cards out there. If you run low on cards, Dave, please call us. We'll get you some more cards. The cards are free to you. Use those cards. Yeah, go ahead and show that card. But in a world of temporary, what can you give? Give a Gideon card, the greeting card that changes everything. Gideon cards are beautiful expressions of faith, hope, and love. But Gideon cards give you a unique way to share a gift of lasting significance with those you love. Unlike other greeting cards, Gideon cards are actually free. And when you give a Gideon card, you donate scriptures that God can use to change lives for eternity. And the process is simple. Choose your card. Write your note. Send your card and donate Bibles. Each year, Gideon's placed some 90 million scriptures into the hands of people in over 195 countries all over the world. People who need the kind of change that only God can bring. I picked up a Gideon's Bible and read it and became immediately peaceful. Um, in a way, that I'd never experienced at the time. The next occasion you have to honor someone special, give them a Gideon card and change a life. Give a voice to your faith in times of joy and sorrow, reflection and celebration, prayer and thanksgiving. Share a Gideon card to express your faith, encourage others, and change lives for eternity. So don't wait. Give the greeting card that changes everything. Send a Gideon card online at sendtheword.org or select a card from the display in your church. Either way, you can give a special gift that's unique and will last. Gideon cards, send the word and change a life. Visit sendtheword.org today. Gideon cards, send the word and change a life.
That's another way too, is to use those cards instead of sending flowers to a lost loved one or something like that. That's a way our church, church is voted just to send the cards and buy Bibles. But each five dollars buys a motel Bible, and the price of everything's gone up. It's more like closer to a dollar and a half for a PWT. No. Anyway, the price will go up a little bit. Five dollar Bible. What kind of a price can you put on a man, woman, boy, or girl accepting Christ as their Savior? It's a fantastic ministry. And we're in, like I say, 200 different countries. And I don't know how many more they are out there, but we're trying to get in all of them. Pray for us. Pray for us. Right there. And I was given this life book here. I believe it's the Gospel of John, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, yeah, one, one of the tools that the Gideons use to uh, get the word out to the people. And uh, uh, I, I tell you, the word works. Man. It, uh, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It works. And I, I always like things that work whenever I want to sleep even. Right? And the Word will do that. But as we work and we give because we understand that the Gideons give things away. They give the Word away. They give Bibles. They give things away. But somebody has to pay for them. So, uh, they give their time. Uh, so we can give our time as there's opportunities as they really didn't point it out that we can give of our time and work in the ministry of the Gideons but also we can give of our substance if we have money we can give money and uh, it's an investment in souls I truly believe that we're missionaries yep we're missionaries hey that's good amen and we might go to a foreign country, one of them 200 and some countries, and be a missionary, but hey, we can be involved in missionary work right here. Amen.